Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. I'm your host, Jerron Harrington, back to hit you with another video. And today, we are going to be concluding Season 1 of What If Bell Crinell Was Thor, Don Machi, The Last King, Season 1, Part 3. But as always, if you're a fan of today's video and everything else that we have to offer on the channel, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcasting that has to come out now and in the future. Now before we get started with this video, I do want to make a brief announcement about how this video is going to be portrayed. Given the fact that the material that we will be covering for the Season 3 finale is a lot of material that we will have to cover, that being from episodes 8 all the way to episode 13, this video is going to be a much more summarized version of the story, meaning there is going to be no original character dialogue or anything of that nature. You could say it, this is mostly just going to be a summary comparing where things change from the original story to this one. Now I know that that kind of storytelling may not be popular, or at least it's not the one that I normally like to do, but in order to make this video as uniform as possible, given the fact that if I really tried to write in detail everything that happened, this video could well be over two hours long. And I would like to avoid that at all costs. So this video is going to be more of a summary video than anything else. And I will try to do better with the pacing of the story as we go forward. I do want to apologize ahead of time. And also let me know down in the comment section below if you prefer this kind of storytelling. I'm not against this formula, although I do like to switch it up from time to time. You could see this type of formula used for videos made by the Anime Sage. He particularly makes his stories in the way that I'm about to. And while I prefer to use the other type of methods, I do like this one as well. But I am just giving you a fair warning ahead of time that I am going to be kind of breezing through the story in a way, just taking note of where things change and adding more to the lore of the story as a whole as we continue. But anyway, without further ado, let's get into today's video as we now conclude What If Bell Crinell Was Thor? Don Machi, The Last King, Season 1, Part 3. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. As our story would continue, both Bell and Lily would make their way into the dungeon, much like they had done once before. And similar to the original canon, Bell and Lily would find themselves face to face with a red minotaur. Bell would attempt to save Lily, moving her out of the way as he engaged with the beast in combat, who carried with it a broadsword. Lily would run off to try to get help and assistance believing that Bell could not defeat the Minotaur on his own. Bell, believing that Lily had gone off to escape, would attempt to hold off the Minotaur with his ability. Having Mjolnir by his side, Bell would also fight with a short sword in his other free hand, using it as a way to complement one another. While Mjolnir could do great damage, it didn't have any sharpness to it at all as it was a hammer, being used as more of a blunt instrument than anything else. Bell would use his short sword as a way of quick striking. If the hammer was the thunder, then his sword was the lightning. Working in tandem, Bell would face off against the red minotaur, doing his best to hold his own. 
Now, unlike in the original timeline, this version of Bell is actually a bit more stronger. The power of Thor coursing through him gives him an initial strength that allows him to match with the Minotaur. However, just because Bell has this power, it does not mean that Bell is all of a sudden able to overpower every monster that comes his way. As I've stated before, the way that Thor's power works in this universe is a lot similar to the powers of the Avatar from The Last Airbender. Yes, just because Aang was the Avatar when we see him at the start of the series, that didn't mean that he was all powerful and that he could just walk through all of his enemies. The powers of the Avatar was something that Aang had to learn and master over time. As such, he grew stronger. The same thing with Bell. He is initially strong, but he will have to train and get stronger and level up. The more he does so, the more he can tap into the true power of Thor, before eventually being able to use it to its fullest capacity. For a better comparison, think of Bell essentially being in the same position that Izuku Midoriya is in in My Hero Academia. Even though Midoriya has One For All, at the beginning, he could not use all of One For All to its fullest capabilities, as his body had not leveled up to the point where he could use it to its fullest extent. So, in a similar way with Bell, he has to grow and level up. The more he does so, the more power he will be able to tap into, and using Milnir as a conduit to unleash that power. So, in the beginning, Bell fighting against the Minotaur, while he is able to hold his own in terms of strength, is still struggling to deal in the finishing blow, as the Minotaur's power is able to match with him. Eventually, Lily would run into Ice and her team, that being the Loki Familia, and she would beg them to help Bell, as they would eventually make their way and find where the Minotaur had escaped, leaving from the lower floors and making its way up, where it had come into contact with Bell as the two of them did battle once again. Everyone would watch as Bell did battle against the Minotaur. Ice Wallenstein eventually feeling as though she may need to get involved. However, Bell would remember the last time he needed to be saved, that feeling of helplessness that washed upon him. As such, Bell would not want to go through the same humiliation again, and similarly, the power of the Argonaut would flow through him. Everyone would watch on as Bell, using Milnir, would throw it repeatedly at the beast, until eventually he was able to break its broadsword smashing him into the ground over and over again. The Minotaur would attempt to grab Bell and slam him into the ground. However, Bell using Milnir would maneuver himself until eventually he got around it and using Milnir, he would attempt to choke out the Minotaur. Using all of his power, he would put his back into it and body slam him to the ground. Once the Minotaur was lying on its stomach, before it had a chance to get up, Bell would take his short sword and plunge it through the skull of the Minotaur. In the process, Bell would then use one of his two abilities, that being the magic ability Lightning Bolt. He would charge a powerful surge of lightning through his blade and into the skull of the Minotaur. However, even while dying, the Minotaur would not stay defeated. As such, Bell would continue blazing through with his sword until eventually he broke it in the process. But after repeated shots of lightning bolt, the beast would eventually be destroyed. The only thing remaining was the horn that would have been broken off by Bell. As Bell slowly stood once again, Lily would run to his side as he had fell unconscious. Unlike in the previous timeline, the Loki Familia would now be much more aware of Bell, as he was known to have the power of Thor on his side, something that would have been made apparent to them by their goddess, that being Loki, whom their Familia was named after in the first place. 
This left them rather curious, as they wanted to know more about him. They would see through on his back, his stats had gone up a bit, and they would see that he had inscribed the power of the Argonaut on his side. This would leave them with more questions than answers, as Bell's name was now starting to become the talk of the town, that being that he now possessed Mjolnir and that potentially the power of Thor had reawoken in the world. However, what this meant for their future, no one was quite sure of yet, but still, it was a sign of things to come. Before long, Bell and the others would return home. As he did so, Hestia would check Bell's status and would see that he had reached level two in only a month and a half, an extraordinary feat to say the least, as there were many adventurers who took at least a year or two in order to reach that high, but to see that he was able to get as far as he did, she attributed it to his skill, the Argonaut, an ability that reflected upon his emotions. From his dreams to wanting to become a hero, it allowed him to be able to turn the tide in battle and to reach levels never before seen. Before long though, Hestia would have to leave, as the day of Dionysius' day had finally come, a day when the gods would meet and would pick a second name for those in their familia, and for Bell, the time had come for him to receive his second name. As Hestia made her way to the hallway in the Temple of the Gods, she would meet with a fellow god that was a good friend of hers, that being Takamika Zuchi. As the two of them talked, they discussed how both of them had members of their familia who had managed to reach a rank of two, while Bell had reached his in less than two months. For Takamika Zuchi, the member of his familia, that being Yamamoto Mikoto, she had reached the rank of two as well, although it had taken her well over a year. As they gathered together, they knew that this was going to be a big day for the members of their familia, as they were now going to have their second names revealed to them. Later on that evening, Belle would go out to celebrate with Lily at the Hostess of Fertility Tavern. For Bell, his second name was something that he had been thinking about for a while, and it was one that Hestia had taken into account, a name that she had heard Bell say when he told her of his visions of the throne room. Gale Thunder. She thought that the name suited Bell and that it would work best for him. He was already gaining more notoriety, so the chance of being inconspicuous was well out the window. But still, if Bell had been given this name in a dream, if this was the name that he would take someday, then Bell Cronell, Gale Thunder, was something that suited him. While there, Seer and Ryu would also join them at the table to celebrate as well for Bell and for his recent merits. As they were discussing their future and Bell's plans to tackle the middle levels of the dungeon, Ryu would warn that it would be in his best interest to wait and gather much more members into a party before attempting to take on the mid-levels of the dungeon, noting that even though Bell had indeed grown stronger, it was unwise to try to take on such a dangerous level on his own. As they were talking though, members of another party would arrive, a muscular adventure, covered in scars. They had come approaching Bell offering to join their party in exchange for bringing along Seer and Ryu, as in all truth, they just wanted to get lucky and believed that Bell would be a quick way for them to get with a few beautiful ladies that night. However, Ryu was having none of it, and she would quickly decline on Belle's behalf, knowing that Belle didn't need to join low lives like them. However, before a fight could break out, the owner, 
that being Mia, would quickly intervene, causing the adventurer and his disruptive party to leave, but not without paying for their bill. Before long though, as Bell was preparing for his next trip in the dungeon, he knew that he needed to upgrade his armor a bit. While going to the Hephaestus Familia's workshop, he would meet Welf Crozo, the man who had been responsible for the armor that Bell had brought before Lau. As the two had met, Bell would be given a new set of armor, one that he particularly liked. It was lightweight but effective, easy for him to put on and maneuver with. It was something that worked for him rather well. Upon meeting the one of whom had made his armor, Bell would be asked by Welf if he could join him on his escapades into the dungeon. And not seeing any reason why not, Bell would accept and would allow for Welf Crozo to join his party, as now a new trio had been formed with Bell, Lily, and Welf. They started off simply in the upper part of the dungeons. In doing so, Bell was able to gauge Welf Crozo and his abilities. He was more than just a talented blacksmith. He was also skilled when it came to fighting as well, being able to hold his own in battle. As they had gotten more time to know one another and to work together going on a few low rank raids, one day, Lily had gotten sick, and Bell would have the day off. Similarly, Welf would invite Bell to a small workshop of his. Taking note of the Minotaur horn that Bell had on him, Welf would use it to make for him a special knife, a blade that could work and stand by him, a compliment for his light speeded armor. As the two talked and got to know one another, Bell would learn of Welf Crozo being renowned for making magic swords. However, he had gotten out of the business a while ago. His reason was rather simple. There were many that came to him for magic swords. However, they never came with a true or pure intent. They only sought out magic swords to make themselves stronger, not to use a weapon that could be loyal and stand by them. Many seeing a magic sword as a quick and easy way to obtain power. However, there was more to it than that. A magic sword, any weapon in general, was supposed to be the one thing that would never betray you. Something that you could rely on if all else fails. For Bell, he understood why Welf kept this to himself. And he didn't mind the deception at all as he felt as though he had his justified reasons for doing so, and he trusted him. As such, the two would continue to go as a party together, along with Lily, and before long, the time came when they had made the preparations as they prepared for the mid-levels of the dungeon. Hestia would see them off as they made their way that morning, and in the beginning, everything seemed fine, However, all wouldn't be what it seemed, as Mikoto, along with their fellow members of the Takamikazuchi Familia, would find themselves in peril as they were being pursued by a various pack of monsters. In the process while trying to escape, they would come across Bell's party, luring the monsters over in their direction, attempting to throw them off onto Bell and his Familia while they would make their escape. Of course, the members of the Familia weren't necessarily happy about it, but in the end, it was a split-second decision that involved their lives, and they knew that this was the only decision that they could have taken. As such, Bell and his team would have no choice but to fight off the horde of monsters that seemed to be never-ending and were constantly spawning and following them. In the process, Bell would suddenly start to have flashbacks, remembering of when Ryu had warned Bell about the mid-levels of the dungeon and about how it could affect a party. 
Bell was now slowly starting to realize that even with his newfound power, there were still many dangers of this world, many of which he had not been fully equipped to handle, as he and his party would soon be driven to exhaustion, running low on energy as they were fighting off the monsters. Hestia would still go to the guild, checking in with Miss Ein and the others to learn of Bell's whereabouts. However, when she sees that Bell hadn't returned after a reasonable amount of time, she would submit a search request for Bell and his party immediately, hoping that if Bell was in trouble, he could be saved before it was too late. Back in the dungeon, Bell's group would have managed to lose the monster's trail just being able to move a few more floors. They were now stuck in a no-win situation. They had no choice but to keep going down deeper into the dungeons. Lily would tell them that if they could make it to floor 18, which was a safe zone where no monsters spawned, then that would allow them a chance to regroup, meet with other adventurers, and then potentially escape. However, to get through there, they would have to make it through to the 17th level, where there was a boss monster that existed. Although, if the Loki Familia had already taken it out as they had gone on ahead, then they should just make it past the 17th floor before it respawned. In the meantime, Takami Kazuchi, as well as his Familia, would meet with Hestia as she had learned the truth of what had happened and that Bell's group might have been endangered because of their actions in the first place. While she was upset with them, she was also reasonable enough to understand why they had done what they did, but still, they wanted to make it up to the goddess and help in any way that they could. From out of nowhere, Hermes, another fellow god, would also make his a presence known, along with his trusted assistant, Osfi arriving and offering a helping hand to an old friend. Although secretly he had his own motives as well for wanting to go and help, as the news about Bell and the power of Thor being brought back into the world was tickling the ears of all of the gods. As such, a rescue team would be put into place. However, it had to be done in secret, as accompanying this team would also be Hestia, and Hermes, and it was strictly forbidden for gods to enter into the dungeon. So this had to be kept very close to the vest, so as to not allow anyone else to know or get involved. Throughout the night, Freya would be pondering about what Hermes was up to, as she too had her own reasons for wanting to get closer to Belle as the young hero was now starting to become much more popular among the gods and garnering much attention from them all. Before the group would leave though, they would be met by Ryu as the elf girl had donned her adventurer uniform once again. She too wanted to join them as Belle was a close friend of hers and she wanted to help him in any way that she could. Meanwhile, with Belle, as well as with Lily and Wealth, they would eventually make their way to the 18th floor. In the process, they would meet with the members of the Loki Familia, who, just as Lily had predicted, would be there. After explaining their situation, they would be given help, as they felt as though they couldn't turn them away, as fellow adventurers in need. Also, they too were curious about Belle as well, more so because of Loki having such a high interest in him. As they were recuperating and recovering, later on in the night, Belle would be awoken, the others would as well, as suddenly Hestia and the members of the rescue team had arrived just in time to meet them. Hestia was happy to see that Belle and the others were alright, and Belle was surprised to see that Hestia of all people had actually shown up in the dungeon. Worried for her safety, Belle would ask if she and everyone else were okay, 
and they would note that they were fine and that they had come to save them. Mikoto would apologize on behalf of her familia for what she had done. However, Belle wouldn't hold it against her, even though Lily and Welf were less than satisfied with seeing her. Belle would make the notion that if they had been in the same situation, he would have done the same thing. In the end, they were just being adventurers and looking out for their familia. He couldn't fault them for that, and he understood where they were coming from. As such, since they were going to have to wait a few days before they could leave, they figured there was nothing left to do but except enjoy the tranquility of the 18th level, a place that was a bit of a paradise. It had a special form of ceiling made entirely out of crystals that when shined bright could be as bright as the sun, but at a certain time would dim down giving the illusion of night. As such, there were also many other places in the 18th floor where they could explore, as it was a safe haven for adventurers when traveling, a case where many people would go in time of need, or a rest stop if they were going to be continuing on their journey in the future. Now back together, they would make their way to a town called Rivera on the 18th floor. This part of the dungeon was actually pretty large, large enough that it gave off the illusion of a countryside. It was even big enough to have its own town, since after all, it was a place of reservation and a place where adventurers could regroup. As such, the group would take some time off, preparing for their journey ahead, as they knew they would soon have to make their way back up and out of the dungeon. In the process, Hermes would spend one-on-one -on -one time with Belle, as he wanted to see the young man that now possessed the power of Thor with him. Belle would show off Mjolnir to the god out of respect, and... For the most part, Belle didn't do anything that would give a bad name to the gods, but rather he showed his reverence for them. However, Hermes showed that even the gods were much more human than people gave them credit for. This was shown no better than when the two of them had begun their walk, as they were discussing many things, Belle soon realized that where they were walking was somewhere that Belle knew they weren't supposed to be. Hermes had actually revealed that he had taken them to where the women would be bathing in private, and he was hoping to get a quick peek. The moment Belle realized this, he would hear the words of his late grandfather once again. His grandfather, who was always a man of great respect and adoration would tell him that peeping on girls was wrong and that this was something that Belle shouldn't do lest he earn the ire of all the people of whom he had built so much trust with. However, in the midst of their conversation, as Hermes attempted to get a closer look at what was going on, it would give away their location immediately. Hermes would attempt to make a quick escape and Belle would end up falling over from the tree that they were standing on as he landed into the water where all of the girls were all at once. Belle attempted to cover his eyes and get as far away as he could. However, the girls on the other hand were completely okay since they knew that Belle wasn't the type of person who could come up with such a plan. Instead, Osfi knew exactly who was behind this. As she turned and realized, it was none other than her god, Hermes, of whom she would quickly make an example of, showing that even the gods could have something to be afraid of at time. Like before, the party that Bell had run into prior, the one of which he had rejected joining, would also be there in Rivera also. Learning that Belle had somehow made it all the way to the 18th floor, the group's leader, whose name was Mord, would become extremely jealous of Belle and his progress, 
and would feel as though he needed to put him in his place. As such, they would come up with a plan. Kidnapping Hestia, they would hold her for ransom and would order Bell to come and fight their leader. However, before the battle would begin, Mord would tell Bell that he couldn't fight with Milnir, believing it was unfair that the little rookie that he called him as now an insult more than anything else, was just being gifted all of this power and all of this acclaim. A claim that he felt as though he had worked years to try to achieve. Bell would agree to the terms, as he didn't like the idea of everyone believing that he only achieved what he did because he had the hammer, that everything he was was attached to it. It was a slow stigma that would start to grow within Bell, while he was grateful for its power, and he didn't deny that it gave him an edge in a lot of what he did. Even Bell would recognize that if he became too reliant on its power, on just the hammer itself, that he would never truly be able to grow as a hero. Bell would agree to the terms, and his fight with Mort would begin. Mort, however, would use cheap tactics and tricks to try to gain the advantage, such as grinding up small crystals in the powder and throwing it in Bell's face to blind him, before using his ability to turn invisible and attack Bell from every direction. As the others watched on, they were starting to worry for Bell. They knew that he was a worthy user of Milnir. That much was proven as he was able to lift up the mighty hammer. However, they were worried about what Bell would be able to do if he didn't have it. What would he do if he ever lost it? Would he truly be able to stand on his own? Or would he fall under the pressure? However, Bell would be able to show them that even without it, he was still a skilled and competent fighter and one that shouldn't be underestimated. Bell had a keen eye for picking up on his opponent's weaknesses, and eventually, he was able to use his instincts and dodge, being able to attack even when not being able to see his opponent. Bell was able to turn the tide of battle, living up to his name of the Argonaut, as he used the same trick, blinding Morg, and using the crystal powder to reveal his location before swiftly taking out his sword and defeating him. Bell would immediately go to Hestia to free her, having won and was now going to leave. However, Mort would try to go in for a sneak attack once again. However, before he could do so, Hestia for a brief moment, in order to save Bell and stop him, would unleash just a small fraction of her godly might, causing him to cower in fear. However, in the process of her unleashing her power, there would be a certain tremor throughout the 18th level, as the ceiling of the floor would start to crack open. From out of nowhere, the boss monster from the 17th floor known as the Black Goliath would appear forcing all the adventurers within the 18th floor to have to gather together and fight, as it was going to take a combined effort to defeat it. Bell knew that it would take using everything he had, using all of his magic ability, if he was going to be able to deliver a death blow to a monster of that size. All the parties that had been on the 18th floor would have to join together at once, even more in his party would have to join and help with everyone else, as they knew that failure to do so would result in all of them dying. Joining together and putting a combined effort, they would focus on attacking the Black Goliath from every angle, attacking at its arms and legs and rendering it immobile, and they knew they would need someone to deal the finishing strike. That was going to be left to Bell. With the power of the Argonaut skill, he would have to charge up a lightning bolt and strike with precision at the monster's head. While everyone else would buy Bell time, 
they would join in attacking the monster and keeping it distracted long enough. As Bell began to channel the energy of the Argonaut, his lightning bolt power starting to increase more and more, Bell would feel a certain rush flowing through him. He would see unique visions in this moment. These visions would be that of the previous Thors, the Thors that had come before him, the Thors of history. As he had seen through it all, he had also seen something, something that was of great importance. For Bell, it was a reassurance that it wasn't just having Milnir that made him powerful, but it was the spirit that he had within him, his spirit to do what was right, his spirit to never give up in the face of danger, his spirit to be a hero is what led him to this point. With full confidence and faith within himself, Bell would rush forward amongst everyone, charging straight towards the Black Goliath. He would use the blade that he had been given by Welf Crozo as he slashed at the head of the beast before taking Mjolnir and raining down a thunderous lightning strike upon him. As the bolt of lightning crashed into its head, as he plunged himself deep within the Black Goliath, obliterating its upper body once and for all, the monster would seemingly be destroyed, as Bell would come falling back to the ground immediately. Everyone would gather around him, happy and proud of his various accomplishments, seeing that he truly was living up to his name as a hero, and slowly but surely, his name would be one that would be known throughout the lands for years to come. Before long, the group would eventually make their way back up to the surface, and after a while, they would stop by the Hostess of Fertility to celebrate. However, as everyone else was enjoying the merriment, Bell was extremely tired, and as such, he found himself resting in Hestia's lap, the two of them resting close to one another. For Bell, his journeys in this new world were far from over, but rather, they were just beginning. In the meantime, though, on the dark island, on the other side of the world, the spirit of the God Butcher was slowly stirring once again. You see, there's a reason why the dungeon was made, and there's a reason why all of the monsters always spawn and are trapped there. 500 years ago, during the Great Battle, a battle known as the Dark Ages, when the God Butcher was sealed away, so too was his children, the children of the God Butcher, known as monsters, were sealed and trapped inside of the dungeon, where the heroes would be allowed to conquer and fight them. In doing so, it would allow the heroes to grow stronger as time went on, hopefully to a point where they would be strong enough to protect their world if such a darkness were to ever appear once again. But now, for the heroes of this world, they would have to prepare, because before long, that darkness would return once again. And when it does, it will come for its vengeance. This concludes What If Bel Crinell Was Thor, Don Machi, The Last King, Season 1, Part 3, The Season 1 Finale. If you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is PowerCore Productions and Podcastings 
that is to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned for tomorrow's video as we are going to be continuing. What if Naruto was trained by Doctor Strange? Naruto Mystic Adventure Shippuden Part 5. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.